When CMT, a songwriter, he prepared to record her first album. Her reaction to his songs would profoundly alter his career. I had just met my uh, producer to be, Brian Ahern, um, and he, had, he and I were listening to material. We, we were just getting to know each other, and he was playing me a lot of songs to consider, for me to consider doing on the album. And I didn't like anything. So I eventually played the Rodney Crowell songs, and she said something like, all right, now we're talking, you know, let's, now we're getting somewhere. I just could not believe this guy. It was like some soul brother, you know, of mine that, that we had never met before. We'd been separated at birth or something. They wanted to record them, so, and they were going to go record in Los Angeles, so that was all well and good and i said well great emmy lou flew rodney to los angeles where she was recording her album pieces of the sky which included rodney's song bluebird wine on the album rodney sang harmony and played guitar emmy lou was so impressed with rodney's talents that in 1975 she asked him to tour with her as a member of her legendary hot band. He accepted without hesitation. He just charmed everybody, and everybody kind of relaxed. And, and it just made the hot band into what it was. I think he was maybe, maybe the most important ingredient. I went on the road with Emmy Lou, and you know, I'm forever grateful to Emmy for, take, you know, for extending my musical education. At the end of Emmy Lou's tour, Rodney decided to pay a fateful visit to an old girlfriend. I happened to to stop through Austin at the end of the tour and uh, to see Martha. After spending some time with Martha, Rodney returned to Los Angeles. A few months later, he received a phone call from Martha. She had news, life-changing news. So she called me in Los Angeles and said, um, by the way, last time I saw you, I got pregnant, and I'm going to have the the child. And I said, well, come on out, you know. You know, I'll, we'll do this together. So she came, you know, and, and the relationship was really over, but she came to Los Angeles, and we got married, and uh, she had... Uh, a baby in May of 1976, Hannah. The relationship between Rodney and Martha continued to be only a friendship, despite the birth of their daughter, Hannah. However, in July of 1977, Martha decided it was time to move on. She said, you take this child and raise it, and she said, and I'll go on and do what I'm going to do, and, I, and you won't have to give me any of your royalties on your songs or anything. You take the money and you... You spend it raising this child. I said, fair enough. I realize now it was, you know, it's my destiny to be a father. So that's when I started my period as a single father in Hollywood. In the summer of 1977, the young father left Emmy Lou and the hot band to pursue his dream of having a solo career. A few months later, he landed a recording deal with the pop division of Warner Brothers Records, the same label Emmy Lou recorded for. Through seeing Amy Lou perform, and they knew uh, Amy Lou was getting a lot of her material from Rodney, he got a record deal with Warner Brothers. She was touring and, you know, playing Dodger Stadium with Elton John and, you know, touring with James Taylor, and it, she had it going on, and I just assumed that if I went off and made my own records, that life would be the same for me. Rodney soon discovered that success was not so easily attained. His first album, Ain't Living Long Like This, was released in 1978, and Warner Brothers had high hopes for it. Unfortunately, low sales and virtually no radio airplay made Rodney's first attempt a dismal failure. It was a wonderful record, but it was, a, it was just one of those records that fell through the cracks. It didn't happen. However, many of Rodney's songs from this album, as well as his next three albums, would become number one hits for other artists a recurring theme that overshadowed his entire career. People started recording my songs off of my, my first few records that I made. People just sort of raided them and recorded the songs. Waylon makes a hit of Ain't Living Long Like This, and Bob Seger does Shame on the Moon, and Crystal Gale does Till I Gain Control Again, and he gets all this enormous success as a songwriter. Success as a songwriter would be followed by success in his love life in the late 1970s. 
At a party, Rodney met a shy and beautiful songwriter named Roseanne Cash, the daughter of country music legend Johnny Cash. As I recall, he didn't even look at me. And I noticed Roseanne, she was sitting under the pool table, just compelling, you know, beautiful, dark and shy. It was a mutual friend, Susanna Clark, Guy Clark's wife, who played the role of matchmaker. The two artists began a professional working relationship that quickly turned romantic. And I think that Roseanne and Susanna concocted the idea that I needed to produce some songs for Roseanne and that would be a, a good excuse for us to get together. So I called him to produce the demos. So I turned him into a producer. Rodney sort of had, you know, eyes for Roseanne as he was producing the record. We, we could tell they were falling in love. Rodney and Roseanne's romance blossomed and they soon moved in together. However, when word got out to her father that some songwriter from Texas was cohabiting with his daughter, Johnny Cash was not pleased. Suddenly, it was time for Rodney Crowell to meet the legendary man in black at his home in Jamaica. We got a summons to Jamaica in the form of airline tickets to go there. We're going to tell him that since we lived together, we were obviously going to sleep together at Cinnamon Hill at the house. And that was just that. I drank myself, had a few uh, Bloody Marys, so that by the time we made it to Jamaica, I was really just sauce. When we got there, Rodney and took my dad off to have a talk with him <laughs> and told him that we were planning on sleeping together. And he looked at me and he said, son, I don't know you well enough to miss you if you were gone. And that's all my dad said. That sobered me right up, and I said, where, where do you want me to sleep? We had separate rooms. <laughs> On April 7th, 1979, Rodney married Roseanne and began sleeping with her with Johnny Cash's blessing. By this time, Rodney had also produced Roseanne's debut album for Columbia, Right or Wrong. With Roseanne's new album receiving rave reviews and Rodney's major success as a songwriter, the daughter and son-in-law of Johnny Cash became Nashville's hippest young couple. They seem the perfect couple because she comes from royalty and and he is the coolest thing to come down the road since Graham Parsons. They were the king and queen of hip. They were a different Nashville. They attracted a whole group of people here. You know, Vince Gill and Emmy Lou Harris and all these people. Rodney's life was a string of successes except for his own singing career. It was going nowhere. Neither of his next two albums for Warner Brothers achieved any respectable sales. When Warner Brothers refused to release another album, Rodney's relationship with the label came to an end, intensifying his frustration and discouragement. They just decided that I was country and that I should be reassigned to the Nashville Warner Brothers label. So I took that opportunity to say thank you very much, but I'm going to go elsewhere. Despite being dropped by his label, the songs of Rodney Crowell seemed destined to stay at the top of the charts as long as they were recorded by other artists. He seemed to be cursed with writing hit songs for other people. Making hits for others became even more of a role for Rodney in 1980 when he produced Roseanne's breakthrough album, Seven Year Ache. The music they created was cutting edge, pushing traditional boundaries. The album produced by Rodney made a star out of Roseanne. Tell me you're trying to kill me seven the records that they were making really revolutionized Nashville production. What you hear today in the country sound is in large measure an outgrowth of what Rodney and Roseanne introduced, which is a slightly edgier percussive sound. I realized that they were doing something that was really pushing the envelope. And, and just watching them work in the studio, I realized also how art artistic they both were. I was enamored with the sound of her voice. I kind of had this romantic attachment to the sound of her voice. And so she would perform. I don't think I would have done a quarter of what I ended up doing if it hadn't been for his confidence in me. Once again, Rodney was relegated to catapulting others to fame, either with his songs or as a record producer. He still longed to have his own career as a solo artist, but for now, the dream continued to elude him. Coming up on CMT Inside Fame, Rodney and Roseanne live out their personal lives through their songs. Here we are, writing a song about 
how cold and distant I am, you know. And later, Rodney makes peace with his father in a final goodbye. He literally died in mine and my cousin Larry Willoughby's arms. When CMT Inside Fame returns.